Don't you think that I can see you're struggling? Don't you think that I can feel your pain? I hear your cries every time. Greetings and welcome to the Logical Belief Ministries podcast. I'm your host, Jason Mullet. Uh, you can visit our website at logicalbelief.org. Uh, you can watch these podcasts on YouTube. You can search for and subscribe to our channel there. Uh, you can find us on iTunes. Uh, just search for Logical Belief. Uh, both the audio and video can be found at our website. Uh, right there uh, on the far right uh, on the top menu uh, bar, just uh, go ahead and click on Podcast. Um, if you want to send me a word of encouragement uh, or you have a question that you want to have answered on the air, uh, you can drop me an email at jason at logicalbelief.org. By sending me an email, however, you are permitting me to read it on the air, so just be aware of that. Um, if you do have any complaints, uh, feel the need to send me any sort of hate mail, uh, or just want to uh, note uh, what an amazing smile that I have, uh, you can send all those uh, messages to joel at joelosteen.com. Alrighty. Well, this is uh, really the first full episode of the uh, this new podcast. And uh, so I just want to briefly go over uh, what our goals are here um, on this broadcast. Um, <clears throat> first of all, um, our goal is to honor and glorify God. Um, and that should be a given for any Christian broadcast, but uh, I will note that this this podcast goal is also for equipping Christians and challenging unbelievers. And we do this uh, by discussing um, apologetics, uh, evangelism, and theology. And this is going to be a broadcast uh, where we learn together. Um, I am a work in progress personally. Um, I have some things that I think I can contribute um, to and help uh, some of you out there in your uh, walk with the Lord, but also with your evangelism and your apologetic and uh, and your theology. But I'm a work in progress myself, so this is... This is uh, the goal of this is um, is a ministry that uh, uh, will help me grow uh, also. So I'll be learning from you guys as we go along. And um, so uh, what we're going to be covering today on today's episode is um, a topic that is uh, near and dear to my own heart. And it is uh, a, a topic that um, has, has caused uh, a, a lot of personal growth in my Christian walk and has given me a, a tremendous amount of confidence and certainty in my, uh, in my Christian faith. And uh, I was introduced to this um, I would say about three years ago um, and that is uh, presuppositional apologetics and so what I want to do in this broadcast is I want to go over a presentation that um, I did with uh, several youth groups uh, one youth group in my uh, my uncle's uh, church in Michigan um, I, I did this presentation for them and I also did it for um, a church I used to attend here in Sarasota um, I, I did the presentation for their youth group also and it was the, the title of the presentation was how do we know and share the truth about the Bible but it was from a presuppositional apologetic uh, perspective and so what I want to do in these first several broadcasts is I want to um, I want to I want to primarily actually to review um, a very famous debate which I've, I haven't seen anybody do this yet so I thought this would be very beneficial um, to the community so 
I wanted to do a review of the Dr. Greg Bonson and Gordon Stein debate. Uh, the debate was on the uh, the subject of does God exist? Uh, Gordon Stein is an atheist, and Dr. Greg Bonson is a is a Christian who approaches apologetics from a presuppositional perspective. And we can see the power of the apologetic in that debate. And so I wanted to do a step-by-step -step review of that debate, and that's going to probably take several episodes to get through because it's a long debate. But I didn't want to just dive into that without uh, giving some of you that have not uh, heard about presuppositional apologetics and don't really have any sort of background in it at all, I wanted to give you a little bit of a primer um, to the, the subject before we dive into the debate. Um, and so I thought, what's, what's better than the presentation that I've already uh, done? And uh, it's been my goal, actually, to put this online at some point anyway, uh, this particular presentation. So this is just a fantastic opportunity in which to do that. So here in the first episode, we'll be going over the subject of presuppositional apologetics, going through uh, the presentation. I have a PowerPoint uh, slide that I use for that. And we'll be going over that presentation and uh, <coughs> and just giving uh, some of you out there that have not even ever heard of those two words strung together at all on what they mean and uh, what this is all about. So um, without further ado, let's just get started into it. Um, instead of, uh, and I'll, as, as we go through it, uh, we will definitely dig more into the details of presuppositionalism. So. Let me just go ahead and transition here to the presentation. Alrighty. Um, one thing when um, we are learning new things is uh, we're going to end up learning new terms. Um, and so be prepared. You're going to probably hear some uh, new language that you may have not heard of before. But I will definitely try to define terms as we go along. Uh, so as not to leave anyone behind. Um, but that's the one thing. As we delve into things like theology and apologetics and science or, or whatever the field of study which we are we're, uh, investing time into, we will always have to acquire new vocabulary in order to thoroughly understand that. So you're going to have to put on your thinking cap as we go uh, through this presentation. So I will do my best to define terms as we go along. Um, and that will also help you be better prepared for when we actually get to the, um, the debate. Uh, you'll, you'll have a better preparation and be better prepared for, uh, for understanding uh, what's going on there. And really <laughs> how devastating uh, the debate really was for Gordon Stein, the atheist. Um, so what we're going to start off with is um, the classic apologetics verse uh, that every apologetics ministry on the planet uh, uses as their motto. But we want to delve into this verse a little bit more, and that is 1 Peter 3.15. Uh, and for those of you that are just watching this podcast, uh, or watching this podcast, rather, listening to this podcast on iTunes, um, obviously you're not going to get the benefit of everything here. Uh, so I will do my best to uh, make sure that you guys can understand what's on the screen here. So... Um, so if, if you uh, have an opportunity to ever get to your computer and, uh, or your smartphone and, and watch the, the broadcast, uh, you, can do, you can do so from YouTube. Um, so First uh, Peter 3.15, uh, let's just go ahead and read the entire verse. Uh, this is from the ESV. Uh, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. One of the things that's really interesting about this verse is, uh, and this is kind of a little, uh, a little rabbit trail here, but this, this verse is actually a powerful verse uh, to demonstrate the deity of Christ. Because in uh, Isaiah 8, verses 12 and 13, um, it speaks of setting apart Yahweh. Um, the almighty Yahweh as Lord in our hearts. And we can see Peter borrowing from that here and, and applying it to Christ. 
and so it's a it's a powerful example of the deity of Christ but uh, um, the word defense in this uh, verse is uh, is translated from the uh, Greek word apologia which is actually where we get the term apologetic and what we'll, we'll talk more about the word apologetic here in a little bit but um, this is where that that's the root um, uh, of of that uh, of the word apologetics, and so this verse here instructs us to provide a, an apologetic to anyone who would ask us for the reason for the hope that is in you. So this is a command of God for all believers, and so we should be equipping ourselves and preparing ourselves for encounters with family and friends and co-workers and anyone that we come in contact with um, but the admonition here at the end is that we do it with gentleness and respect and this actually reminds me of the verse in first timothy where it says to um, deal gently with men and respectfully with men in hopes that god will grant them repentance and so i think those verses go hand in hand um, but the beginning of this verse is what I want to really focus on here. But it says, but in your hearts, honor Christ as the Lord. Honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense. We cannot forget that first part, and that is really the most important part of this verse. And this is where I think presuppositionalism comes in. Unfortunately, a lot of apologetics today abandon establishing Christ as Lord in their apologetic. And we'll get into that, how that is done. Um, as we go on more through the presentation, but just keep that in mind. It is our mandate. Um, the Apostle Peter has mandated us to set apart Christ and honor him as Lord in our hearts before we prepare to give a defense for the hope that is within us. Um, so the next question I want to discuss is is an often straw man argument by the unbelieving world, and that is the statement that um, the Christian faith is blind. So the, the question here is, is the Christian faith blind? And let's see what Scripture actually says about this. In Hebrews 11, 1, and I'm going to read it from both the NIV and the ESV, and this is um, the 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 verse that I have here in Hebrews eleven one I have uh, so if you if you pull up your NIV Bible you may you may read this and you go well that's not exactly how my NIV says it um, well that's because this is from I believe the early eighties nineteen eighty four or something uh, edition of the NIV so the the current NIV edition does not uh, publication does not translate it this way but I really like the way they originally the original NIV translators translated this verse so I'll read it both in the ESV and the NIV let's start off with the NIV first it says now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see and then in the ESV it says now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen so the the Christian faith while we have a faith in something that we cannot physically see with our eyes, you know, we, we cannot see God now. Um, we, we have faith, but the faith that we have is not a blind leap. It's not a God of the gaps, and we leap the gaps with blind faith. Um, it says here that the biblical definition of faith is to be sure, is to be certain, is to have an assurance and a conviction. And what it really comes down to, as we go through the presuppositional apologetic, we will discover that the unbeliever is the one who actually has the blind faith. It's not the Christian. The Christian has many reasons, logically consistent reasons, for why he believes what he does. But the unbeliever does not. The unbeliever, in fact, he believes in fairy tales. He believes that a frog turned into a prince, and he believes that fish became philosophers. Uh, so it is not the Christian. The Christian should not be on the defensive um, in an apologetic situation, but instead should often be more on the offensive because he does have objective truth under him, grounding him. Um, it's, as it's often said, 
uh, when we're in an apologetic situation, look at the unbeliever's feet. What is he standing on? And it's really the same thing we're standing on. He's just denying what he's standing on. And he is accepting things as true with blind faith. And if those things were true, it would lead to an irrational worldview. And so we will we'll delve into that a little bit more. So let's let's next get into um, the the term here that I've been using repeatedly, and that is the term presuppositional apologetics. And uh, let, let's start with the first word presuppositions. Um, this is a definition. It's been a while since I've done this presentation, so I think this is a definition that I had kind of put together um, as a result of several that I um, I picked up. But uh, what, I, what I wrote here is that it's the basic beliefs and assumptions that we all bring to bear before we examine or rationalize about, every, about anything. And when I say all here, I'm not speaking about just Christians. I'm talking about all human beings have basic beliefs and assumptions that they bring to bear before they examine or rationalize about anything, anything whatsoever. And so those are the things that we need to examine uh, when we start examining worldviews. Um, an apologetic is giving a reasoned defense of a position often religious. Um, and so it's not, apologetics is not us apologizing. Oh, I'm so sorry uh, for how my Christian faith has offended you. No, that's not apologetics. Apologetics is giving a reasoned defense for a religious position. And so that that is uh, why those two words are stuck together presuppositional apologetics so the one thing that we have to um, be aware of as we go out into the world and we engage with unbelievers is that everyone has a world view um, and, and we'll get into we'll delve into the different pieces that make up a worldview but these worldviews determine on how we look at evidence our worldview controls the way we view the evidence and so I as a Christian will look at the world and look at evidence through a biblical worldview with my biblical glasses on and the um, naturalist the atheist or the pagan or whoever is going to look at the world through his pair of glasses so it's kind of like this you know I've got as a Christian God has given me a clear set of glasses so I can see the world in clarity but the unbeliever has a um, has a red tinted pair of glasses and he is trying to convince me that the world is red and I'm trying to tell him that no it's not uh, we can sit there and argue all day long and not come to any sort of a conclusion because we're both looking at the world through different glasses and so the presuppositional apologetic is a method um, and I believe a biblical method and we'll get into the biblical arguments of it but uh, is, a, is a method by which uh, we can demonstrate to the unbeliever that they have red tinted glasses on um, the next thing we want to talk about is ultimate authorities. Um, all worldviews and uh, presuppositions are grounded in some sort of an ultimate authority. And that ultimate authority can either be virtuously circular or viciously circular. And I'll try to demonstrate that here uh, in another example that I'm going to give here in a little bit. But um, what we're primarily going to talk about with presuppositional apologetics is we're going to talk about the laws of logic. We're going to talk about morality or ethics. And we're going to talk about the uniformity of nature, um, also known as the inductive principle. And so the God of the Bible can provide a justification and a grounding for the laws of logic, morality, and uniformity. But if we deny the God of the Bible, we have removed that foundation out from under ourselves and we cannot provide a justification for it. Man then becomes the justification and the justification becomes subjective. And that's really what the world, what, what the unbeliever is lost in. He's, he is lost in a pool of subjectivity, viciously circular subjectivity. He cannot escape it. He will try to escape it, uh, but he will only do so uh, using logical fallacies, and that's where you can point that out. And um, but all ultimate authorities are um, 
are circular in nature and we need to have that awareness my ultimate authority is the Bible the Word of God as revealed by the God of the Bible and as God and as his revealed word there is nothing higher that I can appeal to to justify God God has to appeal to himself and we even see this um, in the book of Genesis when God establishes his covenant with Abraham if I'm not mistaken here that he it says he swore by himself because there was none higher uh, for him to uh, swear by and Man, on the other hand, if there is no God, has to provide the justification and the grounding and the foundation for the laws of logic, morality, and uniformity. Um, but that means there's seven billion ultimate authorities running around the planet. Which one should we follow? And who do you, O oh man, have the right to apply your subjective um, ultimate authority to the rest of us? And is, is that... Is that this is the funny part is that objectively wrong for you to apply your subjective morality or logic or uniformity upon the rest of us um, so it just becomes it becomes uh, uh, viciously circular for the unbeliever I'll give you an example here of an ultimate authority um, the the ultimate authority or the standard for a meter is actually a I think it's uh, made in, of platinum, if I remember right, but is the Meter de Archive in, located in Paris, France, and that is the standard for the length of a meter. Now, all meter sticks need to appeal to the authority of the Meter de Archive as the justification for the fact they are, in fact, a meter in length. So if I go pick up a meter stick at a local hardware store, and my friend asks me, well, how do you know that's a meter in length? Well, the only way that we could justify that is if the meter was in some way uh, has a has a path back to the standard for what is a meter. That is its ultimate authority. That is its justification for the fact that it's actually a meter in length. If it was one centimeter longer than the meter de archive, it would not be a meter in length. Um, it is its ultimate authority. Um, a meter stick that would appeal to itself as the justification for the fact that it was indeed a meter in length would be viciously circular. It would just say, well, I'm a meter in length because I myself am the definition of a meter. But if all meter sticks in the world are their own definition of what is a meter, then we have chaos. Because one meter stick could be one meter in length, uh, another could be the, the actual meter. One could be a yard, one could be three feet, one could be 10 cent centimeters, and they could all say, well, I'm a meter in length, and now we have chaos. And that's what a world that denies God leads to, ultimately, to chaos. And so I have here a meter stick that appeals to itself as a justification for the fact that it is indeed a meter in length would be viciously circular. It would be an example of a viciously circular position. The meter de archive can and this would be just as God can appeal to itself as the actual standard of what is a meter, and this would be virtuously circular. Um, we couldn't ask the question, well, what justifies that the meter de archive is actually a meter in length? Well, there is no justification outside of itself because it is the definition of what a meter is. So uh, that is that it would be virtuously circular. So the next thing we have to understand is that when it comes to evidence, and this is where the unbelieving world wants to go, um, you know, when, when we as Christians stand in our faith and we say that, you know, God created the world in a span of six days, you know, maybe around 6,000 years ago, um, they're like, well, what about these rock layers? And what about uh, these fossils? Uh, what about, uh, um, you know, all, all these supposed uh transitional uh, fossils that they found uh, what about Australopithecus or whatever and um, and the, the point is is that we all have the same evidence we have the same rock layers we have the same bones in the ground but the issue is is that we're looking at these through a different world view so it becomes it becomes an issue we're just we're both looking at it through different glasses and I see the rock layers as evidence of Noah's flood. I see the fossils 
as evidence of Noah's flood, uh, as a as a massive global catastrophe. As a Christian, that's what I see it because I'm looking at it through biblical worldview. But the unbeliever denies that he's got a naturalistic worldview. So the what we have to really examine now is the worldviews, not the way that we look at the evidence through our worldviews. So we all interpret the evidence with our worldview. The question really is, is which worldview makes the human experience intelligible that provides rationality? Which one provides rationality? Which one uh, makes the human experience possible? Um, and so that is what we need to examine. Now, what will happen is um, if if we don't examine our presuppositions and our worldviews and our ultimate authorities, uh, and instead we look at evidence, what all of us will do, both Christians and atheists, if we ignore the worldview problem, we will all use rescuing devices to save our worldview from evidence that would appear to be contrary to it. So a rescuing device is a method employed to rescue a person's presupposed worldview from evidence that would seem to be contrary to it. And so I'll give an example here. So as a Christian, I could go up to a, a naturalistic atheist um, who believes in cosmic evolution, and I could say, why are there still comets in the solar system if comets typically do not last more than 10,000 years? As they orbit the sun, they lose material, and so a comet cannot last an indefinite amount of orbits. And at the rate of material loss, you know, a comet's not going to last more than about 10,000 years. Well, well, they'll come back, well, there's an Oort cloud. Okay. Well, the question I can ask him is, uh, have you guys observed the Oort cloud? Well, no. Have, do you have any evidence for the Oort cloud? Oh, well, yeah, there's still comets here. And the, you know, the universe is 13.7 billion years old the earth is 4.5 billion years old so there you know there must be an earth cloud because we still have comets it's actually a circular argument um, but that they're going to appeal to this rescuing device and it's not necessarily invalid they don't have any evidence for it they've never observed it um, they they haven't uh, they haven't uh, seen this, um, but they believe it because it's the only justification they have for why there would still be comets. Um, here's a question that uh, a Christian could ask an unbeliever. He could say, why is there still C-14 found in dinosaur bones and even in diamonds? Diamonds retrieved from deep inside the earth still have carbon-14 in them. Uh, carbon-14, if the... Um, at its uh, radioactive decay rate and its half-life would have would have no ability to um, if the entire earth was a mass of carbon-14 um, within less than one million years all of it all of it would have decayed um, uh, back to uh, uh, to uh, normal carbon and uh, carbon-12 I believe and uh, so there would be no C14 left. Um, so why do we still find C14 in dinosaur bones and diamonds? And the unbeliever will just say, well, you know, there's been some sort of contamination possibly uh, that we, you know, or, or maybe in the future we'll find out why this anomaly exists. I'm not sure how they would answer the contamination for a diamond. I mean, a diamond's like the hardest substance on the planet. Why does it have C14 and how did contamination get in there? But um, uh, that's beside the point. They will still come up with a rescuing device of some type. Uh, here's another question you could ask the unbeliever. How did random molecules organize themselves into an irre irreducibly complex self-replicating organism, the first life? You know, the problem that uh, evolutionists usually try to leap over is they, uh, they, they, uh, they talk about microevolution and they expand it into macroevolution and, and they'll argue from that point and they just want to even skip over the, the massive question about how did life uh, begin in the first place. But uh, what they'll typically say is, <laughs> and 
I actually forgot I had this in this presentation, but but Richard Dawkins in the uh, documentary Expelled um, uh, actually said aliens did it. I mean, there we go. That is that's a rescuing device. I mean, it's a poor one uh, because it ends up with an infinite regress. I mean, obviously, where did the alien life come from? But uh, oh, I'm not supposed to ask that question. Nope. That's an unintelligent question to ask. That's, um, that's uh, you know, we as Christians aren't rational. We don't think clearly. So, you know, you couldn't ask that question. But uh, aliens did it. So that's, that's Richard Dawkins. Um, here's, here is a rescuing device that a Christian will have to employ when it comes to ask for evidence. Um, and this is one that unbelievers do like to ask Christians. And it says, uh, how can the earth be 6,000 years old if we see galaxies millions of light years away? Well, you know, as a Christian, I, with my biblical worldview on, I'm going to say that um, I personally, I, I have two personal <laughs> theories that, that uh, I enjoy on this particular topic. And that is, uh, I really like the white hole cause cosmology theory put together by uh, Dr. Russell Humphreys, and I, I have a book on that, um, which uh, if any of you guys, uh, uh, I don't actually even have that. I think it's called uh, Starlight in Time by Dr. Russell Humphreys, if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong on that, but you can read about that there. Um, it looks like a very, uh, there's still several issues with it, but uh, it, it's a, it's a very, uh, uh, it's it's a good theory, and also Dr. Jason Lyell has uh, what he calls the anisotropic synchrony convention, and he has a video out there on your origin origins matter, I believe is where he has it, where he talks about this, um, and this is also a possibility. It's 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 a, with the two ways uh, uh, speed of light, um, both uh, that way and reflected back. It's it's hard for us to, or it's really impossible for us to measure the two way speed of light. Um, or the one-way speed of light, sorry. Um, so that's that's a possibility. You know, there's also some people adopt the uh, the possibility that God simply created the light in transit. I would reject that from the perspective that I don't see God as one who um, is a deceiver in any way. Um, because if light was created in transit, uh, this would imply that what we see out there that's beyond 6,000 years never really happened. It's just um, basically a picture of God's painting in the sky. I really believe the galaxies, uh, the distant stars, are really there. They're not just a um, a television show going on in the night sky for us. So, uh, you know, when we see a, a star go supernova, um, I believe that star actually went supernova. It's not just a million um, light year uh, television show. So, uh, so I think it, that really, uh, I, I don't like the, uh, that, that option, but that's, uh, we're kind of running on a rabbit trail here, but let's get back on the topic here. So the one thing that we as Christians have to be aware of, um, in our apologetic is something called the pretended neutrality fallacy. And this is often actually committed by Christians more than than unbelievers. Uh, usually, the Christian will say, "Well, I I need to when I talk to unbelievers," and and this comes back to theological uh, groundings, which I think is why theology is so important when it comes to our evangelism and our apologetic. If we don't have a good grounding in our theology, we will fall into uh, these type of errors, and that is where we abandon uh, scriptural um, authority and try to meet the unbeliever on neutral ground. Oh, uh, you know, in, in my apologetic, I can't, uh, this would be the argument, um, in my apologetic, I can't uh, use the Bible. No, because the unbeliever says he doesn't believe the Bible. So I have to go outside the Bible and I have to show him evidence and prove to him the Bible is true. That way he will come to believe the Bible. That's the neutrality fallacy. And we'll, we'll look at to why that's not biblical here. But here's the thing. As you see in the graphic here, you see once the believer is over in the neutral ground, he's abandoned the Bible. 
the unbeliever goes, I'm done. The argument is over at that point because you have gone into the discussion with the um, perspective that the Bible is not true, but that's what the unbeliever believes, and you're trying to convince him that it is. And so this is um, really a fallacy. Uh, there is no neutral ground. The point is, is we all have a world view. We all have a way that we look at the evidence, and that is what needs to be examined. And and the Bible cannot be abandoned. I can't abandon my worldview to try to conv and jump into the atheist's worldview. I can't put on his red tinted glasses and then try to convince him that the world is not red. Um, and let's look at if Jesus accepted the neutrality fallacy. In Matthew 12, verse 30, once again, this is from the ESV. Jesus said, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. So Jesus didn't give room for neutrality. If you're not with Christ, you are against him. And he even says here that if you don't gather with me, if you're not working actively to gather with me, you're actually working actively to scatter against Christ. You're not sitting there on the sideline, you know, with a neutral position against God. And besides, to be neutral against God is a sin. So that becomes an active aggression against God. It says in uh, Romans 8, verse 7, it says, For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So if the unbeliever is hostile to God, the God of the Bible, then he's not neutral. I can't meet him on his hostility to, gra to God ground. It says in Romans 8, 7 that he's hostile to God. So if I need to abandon my biblical worldview and jump onto his ground to convince him, it's, it's a hostile territory, and it's against God. As a Christian, I cannot go there. Um, as I already mentioned, to be neutral to our creator is sin, and the unbeliever is not neutral. And as Dr. Greg Bonson says, you should not pretend to be neutral either. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is the judge and jury problem. It's, I, I wrote here, it says, accepting the pretended neutrality claim and attempting to convince the unbeliever of the probable existence of God is making the unbeliever the judge and jury over the God who created him. Um, and the, uh, the other problem is with arguments outside, and it's noted here, it said to the probable existence of God, is to arguments that go outside of the certainty of Scripture that God exists become arguments of probability, arguing that God most likely exists, that uh, the evidence uh, seems to lean that way. Um, uh, you, you have the famous Pascal wager. Um, you know, if, uh, if, if you're right... Um, you know, both of us just die, rot in the ground, and no big deal. But if I'm right, uh, whoa, you know, you're in trouble. And, uh, you know, as a Christian, if I'm right, if God does exist, you as the unbeliever are in trouble. And so that's not, that's arguing for a probabilistic God. Here's the problem with this. Don't we as Christians claim to have a relationship with this God? Don't we claim that we, that we know him and that we have communion with him? Now, what if I told you that um, I have a great relationship with my wife, um, but uh, she just probably exists? I'm, you know, I'm not certain that she exists, but the evidence uh, does point to that she probably does exist. How can I have a relationship with a probabilistic person? So the Christian that goes to church and is worshiping the God that he knows exists and is certain about that, knows that he's been saved and communes with God in prayer and reading scripture, but then goes out on the street and tells the unbeliever that God most probably exists, is being inconsistent. And we as Christians should be the most consistent people on the planet. 
and this is unacceptable for us so so making the unbeliever the judge and jury over God who created him is not acceptable for us in Deuteronomy 6 verse 16 it says you shall not put the Lord your God to the test we don't give the unbeliever evidence to try to convince him this is like a court situation um, where evidence is prevent, presented in order to try to acquit the defendant God is not the defendant God is the judge it says in Romans 1 verse 18 it says for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so they are without excuse God has given us wonderful evidence and we can very likely acquit God in a trial but even if we win that case the unbeliever is still the judge and jury over the God who created him even if I convince the unbeliever of the probable existence of God and he says he now believes in God he still is holding that evidence and his view of the evidence as the ultimate authority and not scripture and not God anyone who is a Christian because of the evidence when the evidence seems to become contrary to the uh, to uh, to that he will abandon the faith and that is because he was never truly a believer a believer makes Christ Lord you cannot argue your way out from under the Lordship of Christ you cannot be convinced out from under the Lordship of Christ because if you could he was not Lord um, and so so the thing that you know we have to be careful of is that is that we don't uh, encourage people to become Christians because of evidence because they may read a Richard Richard Dawkins book several weeks later and now they think they have evidence that God doesn't exist and so now they don't believe in God again um, we we use the truth of the gospel to bring people to repentance and faith so that they can see the truth um, and that is also in first Timothy grant that in hopes that God grants them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth um, they cannot see the truth until they repent um, we don't bring them to the truth so that they'll repent we pray that God grants them repentance so that they can see the truth um, in Psalm 14 1 it says the fool says in his heart there is no God now the Bible is not engaging in name calling here it's just it's just talking about the state of mind of the one who is denying the existence of God because as it says in Romans 1 it says that it's plain to them they do know that God exists so what they're doing is that they are denying what is plain to them God calls that foolishness and we as Christians should uh, not accept the unbelievers claim that he doesn't know God exists I mean I even have um, uh, atheist uh, friend of mine that uh, I go out to uh, lunch with uh, in fact I went out to lunch with him yesterday and um, I I even told him this verse um, I uh, actually yesterday was one of the first times I had I, I had witnessed to him uh, in, a, in a long time I had given him the gospel about um, well it's been over a year and uh, I, I don't I don't badger people when I, once I give them the gospel I uh, I let them go but uh, I had another opportunity to kind of speak to him again and uh, and to and to go through scripture and um, I'll, I'll get into that maybe in another podcast really what what all happened there you know it was a very interesting situation <laughs> um, but uh, we'll get into that more but uh, it says here the scripture says here that the fool says in his heart there is no God and it says in Proverbs 26 verse 4 um, and this here is really kind of the 
I don't know if you would use the term the motto verse in Proverbs 26 verse 4 and 5, but um, is the way that we as uh, presuppositionalists um, can use this verse as our guide to how to deal with those who deny God. And the answer, and in this verse, in verse 4, it says, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. And this here is, I believe, talking about the pretended neutrality fallacy. In other words, don't, don't accept the supposed neutral position that the unbeliever says he has and try to argue to God. Um, instead, uh, what it says here, that if we do that, we will be like him yourself. But in verse 5, it says, Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. Now, these verses aren't contradicting one another. It's talking about two different ways of doing this. So what I can do then is I can jump into the unbeliever's worldview and I can show him where his worldview logically takes him. If he stays logically consistent with his worldview and takes it to the conclusions that it must lead to, you can demonstrate his folly to him. And it says here, lest he be wise in his own eyes. And so this is really the grounding for how presuppositionalism is done. We um, don't answer the fool according to his folly by jumping into his state of claimed neutrality and try to argue towards God or to God. But instead, we jump into his worldview and show that his worldview leads to irrationality and self-refuting uh, positions. Um, in Romans 1, it also says, claiming to be wise, they became fools. And in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 20, it says, Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Um, and as we dig more into presuppositional apologetics, and as you get deeper into it, you will start recognizing and realizing really how foolish, how absolutely foolish the wisdom of the world is um, in comparison to the revelation of God. Um the one thing that we cannot forget, though, and I, you know, for those of you that are new to presuppositional apologetics, one of the dangers of presuppositionalism is that once we see how to use it and we see how effective it is and how it absolutely destroys atheism, uh, my position is, is that it would also destroy other aberrant um even Christian, uh, Christianized uh, worldviews. Um, the thing that we have to remember is that if it were not for the grace of God, we would be fools like the unbeliever. We must remember this. In 1 Corinthians 4, 7, it says, what do you have that you did not receive? And we cannot stand there in a position of pride and destroy the unbeliever and demonstrate his folly to appease our own pride. And that's the dangerous part of presuppositionalism. And, you know, I'll say that right up front. And that's something that I even have to battle in my own life. The goal in presuppositional apologetics is to glorify God first, to set apart Christ as Lord. And we do this by standing on God's truth and and by providing a reasoned defense because the word of God is true. And we, and we glorify the word of God and we glorify God by not abandoning truth and by, and by using an apologetic that demonstrates the truth of God's word. Um, and we also, in our apologetic, yearn and should desire that men come to repentance and faith. And so our evangelism should always be part of our apologetic. A, an apologetic that does not involve a presentation of the gospel um, is more about pride than it is about uh, following the Great Commission. Um, so the unbeliever is in a state where he is constantly, um, uh, and on my screen here, for those of you guys that are listening to this, um, he is. there's a picture of a beach ball here in a pool. And the unbeliever is like, if you've ever been in a pool and you've you know had one of those beach balls and you try to keep it underwater, 
That is what the unbeliever is doing. The unbeliever is constantly pushing down on the beach ball. He's pushing it down. He's trying to keep the knowledge of God um, and his, uh, his knowing God uh, down under the water. But he has to fight it. He has to keep pushing it down. He has to keep pushing it down because it will pop back up. And it will constantly pop back up. And the point of presuppositionalism is keep pointing out, oh, the ball just popped up over there. Oh, oh, there it is. Oh, you just it just popped up again. And that's what you watch is that they will be inconsistent. They cannot stand on their worldview. They will they will constantly jump over to your worldview, borrow from the Christian worldview, um, to argue against the Christian worldview. And every time they do it, point it out. Say you just borrowed from my worldview again. Uh, you're demonstrating that God exists. I'll give you an example of it. I, I was out once uh, doing some door-to-door uh, witnessing in a uh, community around uh, the church I used to attend. And uh, there was a guy by the name of Dave. And there was a woman with me, or two women with me, that uh, we were uh, uh, we were doing some witnessing. And they, they were the, the ones who were doing... Uh, it was evangelism course we were on and I was going along to try, kind of help them along. And so I was letting them do most of the talking. And so they were trying to go through the gospel with this man. And he was kind of, um, he was a little, he was a little arrogant. He was being a little condescending to them. And so, um, he was kind of making fun of him. And so I, I kind of jumped in and cause he said he was an atheist. And so I jumped in and I said, uh, I said, Dave, I said, um, uh, I'm trying to remember exactly how I started, but I, I just asked him, I said, so it, it sounds to me like you don't believe in truth. You don't, you don't think there's such a thing as absolute truth. And, oh, actually, I'm, I'm going to have to jump back here. Um, I, I, I asked him if he, if he thought uh, contradictions were a problem because he had some, something about contradictions in the Bible. And he said, uh, um, uh, yes, that, that contradictions were a problem and uh that that they were wrong and that they were actually uh lying he said to contradict oneself would be lying and i said well I, I agree with you dave i said would would you say dave that uh, there is such a thing as um as absolute truth and he said um he said no no and i said well is that absolutely true and he kind of looked a little shocked and i said it sounds to me like you're not really certain about anything. He said, yeah, absolutely. I don't, I don't really have any certainty about anything. And I said, well, Dave, are you, are you certain about that? And he kind of was taken back again. And I said, you know, Dave, you don't seem, it seems to me like you live in a world of, I don't know. And he goes, absolutely. He goes, I, I don't, I don't really know, um, know anything. I don't, I, I live in a world of, I don't know. And I said, well, Dave, do you know that you live in a world of, I don't know? And I said, Dave, you you just contradicted yourself three times in a row. This demonstrates to me that you're lying about the fact, because you just said to contradict oneself intentionally is to lie. It demonstrates to me that you're lying when you say that you don't believe God exists. And he was taken back, and that really kind of uh, stopped his... Um, his 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 little bit arrogant tirade against these women and and that's that's what he was doing he was he was pushing down that beach ball but it kept popping up and uh and as a christian all i had to do is just point that out um it wasn't even a really long engagement with him um it was uh, pretty straightforward and so that's what we'll we'll see happening when we're out there now the next thing we want to talk about is um, is knowledge, and uh, I like Plato's uh, definition of knowledge. And uh, he, Plato describes knowledge as a uh, as a justified true belief, and um, that's kind of a common philosophical definition for what knowledge is. Um, another word we're going to look at is the, the term epistemology. Epistemology is the branch of philosophy concerned with the nature and scope of knowledge and also referred to as the theory of knowledge. So um, you're going to hear me use this word epistemology, and so I don't want, I want to make sure it's clearly defined, is, is really just a, a, a theory of knowledge. And so we as Christians have a biblical and uh, epistemology, a, a revel, uh, 
revelational epistemology. Um, and the unbeliever um, has a subjective epistemology. He can't really ground um, his ability to know anything um, in anything other than himself. And so um, it says here, the Christian has a revelational epistemology that makes sense of the world. The unbeliever has a self-contradictory epistemology that leads to absurdities. The biblical Christian worldview is the only worldview that can account for and justify knowledge. The biblical Christian worldview is the only worldview that makes knowledge possible. Um, in Colossians 2 verse uh, starting in 2b and going into verse 3 it says Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge uh, in Proverbs 1 7 it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and fools despise wisdom and instruction so in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge all wisdom and knowledge sources and comes from Christ the creator of all things Colossians chapter 1 and um, so, so the unbeliever, when he claims to know things, he's ultimately borrowing from our worldview that can justify knowledge, but they cannot. Uh, Jesus also says in John 15, verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches, whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Uh, let's talk about the laws of logic now. The laws of logic are immaterial. Uh, this is the nature of the laws of logic. They are unchanging, or um, you could use the term immutable too, which is also used of God. And uh, it's universal. They apply everywhere. Um, the Christian worldview is the only one that can justify the existence of immaterial, unchanging, and universal abstract entities like the laws of logic. If, the, if all we have is the naturalistic world, only all we have is matter and energy and motion, then where do the laws of logic come from? I can't pull out a plate of logic out of my refrigerator. I've never stubbed my toe in a block of logic. Um, but yet, we all appeal to it. We all use it. So it's immaterial. It doesn't extend into space. It's unchanging. Um, I, I don't, I don't uh, one morning get up and go, wow, you know, the laws of logic uh, changed this morning. Uh, today, contradictions are true. Um, they're universal. They apply everywhere. You know, um, astronomers, when they stare out into the deep space, don't think that a galaxy can both be there and not be there at the same time and in the same place. Um, they don't believe that. So they believe in the laws of logic. They appeal to it. They use it um, all the time. All of us human beings do, but we cannot justify it unless we have a Christian biblical worldview. Now, here's what will happen, though. The unbeliever will keep on using the laws of logic to argue against the Christian worldview, but in doing so, he's borrowing from the Christian worldview to argue against it because his naturalistic worldview, um, especially if he's talking about an atheist here, um, cannot justify his, uh, his position. So um, here I have a graphic. Uh, once again, for those of you uh, on the air, you'll have to go watch the video to see this, but... Uh, this is a graphic from the Ultimate Proof of Creation, Dr. Jason Lyle's book. Uh, by the way, I have these graphics uh, in, um, I have permission to use these. So, um, the, uh, the unbeliever is standing um, on top of the laws of logic, uniformity of nature, and absolute morality, but he has no grounding underneath it. He's just standing in midair. But the believer has the word of God below the laws of logic, the uniformity of nature, and absolute morality, and the word of God justifies our belief in these and we'll look at that in more detail the biblical Christian worldview is the only worldview that provides a foundation and justification for our basic presuppositions logic uniformity and morality for someone to argue against the Christian worldview they would have to borrow presuppositions from the Christian worldview to argue against it they have to borrow capital from the Christian worldview I'll give you some examples here. The unbeliever arguing against the Christian worldview is like a man who is arguing against the existence of air, but in order to make his argument, he has to use air for breathing and for transmitting his arguments. I think I heard Jason uh, Lyell, this might be a Dr. Greg Bonson um, uh, example. I'm not sure exactly where that came from. Um, another example that I've heard used, and I'm not sure the source of this one either, but the unbeliever is arguing against the Christian worldview is like a man arguing against the existence of words. 
but in doing so, he must use words to make his argument. I think this might have come from Seit and Burden Um An example that I've used is it's like a man standing in the fifth floor of the Empire State Building arguing with another guy that the uh, floors, the foundation and floors one through four don't exist. Um, he believes the fifth floor, because he's on it, exists, and the floors above it exist, but he denies that the logically prior and temporally prior floors don't exist. Um, and he makes fun of the man who believes they exist. Um, but yet, the only reason he's even standing there on the fifth floor is because of the logically prior and temporally prior floors. And that's exactly what the unbeliever does. He denies the foundation underneath his feet um, and what's even propping him up uh, in order to argue against the Christian worldview. Um, the law of non-contradiction, this is one of the laws of logic. Uh, <clears throat> this is the second law. Uh, formalized by Aristotle, the laws of law, uh, the law of non-contradiction states that something cannot both be true and not true at the same time when dealing with the same context or when dealing with the same time and, and same place is often how it's summarized. Um, so the law of non-contradiction, um, you need to be well familiarized with it and recognize when people do contradict themselves. Uh, a lot of times it's fairly easy, but sometimes it can be a little bit obscure. So uh, you just have to kind of watch for this. Um, the other thing to look for and to uh, study is uh, some logical fallacies. And there is a plethora of different logical fallacies out there, and I have some books I can recommend for you to study on these uh, topics. But I'm going to point out about um, two or three that, I see used the most out there in engaging with the unbelieving world and the ones that I point out the most. Um, so a logical fallacy is defined as a flaw in the structure of a deductive argument, which renders the argument invalid. And so I'm going to talk about really about four fallacies. And this is uh, I'm going to talk about circular reasoning, begging the question, which is a form of circular reasoning. Um, and affirming the consequent and self-refuting statements, which are just self-contradictory statements. Um, the first one we're going to look at is a logical fallacy. Uh, circular reasoning is a logical fallacy in which the conclusion is a stated premise. It's very, very obvious that it's circular. Um, an example of this would be like, my, my reasoning is valid because it has always worked for me in the past. Um, He's using his reasoning here to demonstrate his reasoning is valid. Uh, the Bible is true because 2 Timothy 3.16 says the Bible is inspired by God. That is true. That is a circular argument um, and should not necessarily be just used that way. Um, what we do is demonstrate that the Bible and the Word of God is the only worldview that leads to um, rationality. And so... I wouldn't just say the Bible is true because the Bible says it's true. That's definitely circular. Uh, we date the uh, geological, this is, a, this is a classic one done by evolutionists, we date the geological rock layers with index fossils that we find in the layers, and we date the fossils by the rock layers they're found in. Uh, just uh, viciously circular. Um, I don't have a world view because I come to the evidence completely neutral and let it lead me to rational conclusions. I've been told by unbelievers that they don't have a worldview. Well, the thing that's um, hilarious about that is because that is a worldview. Um, the belief that you don't have a worldview is in itself a worldview. Um, so those are all examples of circular reasoning. Uh, begging the question um, is a, a form of uh, circular reasoning. Um, but it says, it's, uh, I have written here, it says, a logical fallacy in which the premise of an argument presupposes the truth of its conclusion. In other words, the argument takes for granted what is supposed to be proved, a form of circular reasoning. Um, example of this would be, I expect the laws of science to be the same in the future, uh, in other words, uniform, because they've always been that way in the past. But this is begging the question, because that's exactly the question that's being asked. Why have they, why will they be the same in the future? I know they've been that way in the past, 
But that's not what I'm asking. I'm asking why do you expect them to continue that way in the future? And so to appeal to the past is simply to beg the question. Uh, creationism is not science because it's a supernatural explanation of origins. Evolution is science because it's a naturalistic explanation of origins. Um, the person here is assuming naturalism to be true. Um, and so he's begging the question. He's simply defining science as his own naturalistic worldview and saying that if uh, creationism isn't science because it's not my naturalistic worldview. Okay? You just said that creationism, the creationist biblical worldview isn't true because it's not your worldview. Um, you're simply begging the question. The belief in God is universal. After all, everyone does believe in God. Uh, example of begging the question. Uh, here's, here's one. Uh, Rene Descartes, um, an atheistic philosopher, said, I, I think, therefore I am. Well, the I think uh, presupposes the I am. So he's begging the question. Uh, there is no need for objective morality. After all, we all believe in human rights. Uh, this is actually one that um, I got from an atheist, uh, a Jewish atheist woman we were on the witnessing uh, up, um, out on the streets. And uh, she said that uh, there is no need for objective morality. After all, we all believe in human rights. Um, well, <laughs> are human rights an objective moral truth? Should Should we... Should we um, uh, should should we all believe that the human being is is uh, uh, valuable, is important, and that should be given rights? Um, that's to beg the question. Um, she's appealing to objective moral rights, saying there are no objective moral rights. Uh, survival of the fittest is actually to beg the question because. Um, They'll say, how would you prove that the fittest survive? Well, you would just say that those that survive are the fittest. Okay. Well, that's begging the question because that doesn't, that doesn't prove. It just means survival of the survivalist. The one that survives simply survived. It doesn't, uh, it, you're, you're begging the question because you're simply assuming that those who survive are the fittest. Um, so an example of begging the question. Um, another logical fallacy is affirming the consequent. And this is one that I see used quite often. And actually, here's the interesting thing. I see this used by professing Christians when it comes to exegesis of the scripture. Um, I see affirming the consequent actually used quite often. And so this is something to be aware of. It doesn't just happen with atheists but um, uh, and the naturalistic worldview. But um, here's an example of... Um, so let's use the statement, if it is raining, then the lawn is wet. So there's two parts to this statement. Um, if it is raining would be known as the antecedent, and the lawn is wet would be the consequent. Um, so it is raining is the antecedent, the lawn is wet is the consequent. So to affirm the antecedent would be to, to say that it is raining, um, it is raining, therefore the lawn is wet. That is a logical conclusion. That is correct. You can affirm the antecedent. Um, however, you cannot deny the antecedent. To deny the antecedent would be a, a, a formal fallacy. It is not raining, therefore the lawn is not wet. Okay, well, I'm denying the antecedent, but the lawn could be wet for other reasons. The sprinkler system could be on. So just because it's not raining does not mean the lawn cannot be wet. So denying the antecedent is a logical fallacy, but um, uh, so let's deny the consequent. The lawn is wet, so let's deny that. The lawn is not wet, therefore it is not raining. That would be correct. That would be a correct deduction. Um, so that is not a formal fallacy, uh, but however, here's the most common, affirming the consequent. I see this happen all the time, and I'll give you some examples of it. The lawn is wet, therefore it is raining. This is affirming the consequent. Remember our consequent was the lawn is wet. I'm now affirming it. I'm saying the lawn is wet. Therefore, it is raining. Well, it could be raining for other, or it could be wet for other reasons too. The sprinkler system could be on. Um, 
a water truck uh, exploded beside the lawn, um, a fire hydrant cut loose. There could be a lot of other reasons why the lawn is wet um, other than it is raining. So affirming the consequent um, is a formal fallacy. Um, so let, let's let's pull up an example here, often used by um, atheists. This is a common one that they will they will use in which they're affirming the consequent, and that is if there was a common ancestor, then DNA would be similar between living organisms. Now I accept that statement. If there was a common ancestor, then DNA would be similar. That is correct. But this is what the unbeliever will do. They will um, affirm the consequent. They'll say DNA is similar between living organisms. Therefore, this proves there is a common ancestor. Well, this is affirming the consequent. This is wrong. See, here's the thing. There could be other reasons why DNA is similar between living organisms. If there was a common designer, then DNA would also be similar between living organisms. So to use this as an argument for evolution, which is actually very common, um, is to affirm the consequent. Um, another type of logical fallacy that we'll encounter out there is self-refuting statements, a claim or, or statement that does not meet its own conditions, a statement that contradicts itself. Uh, for example, all truth must be empirically confirmed with science. Well, what about this statement? Is this, is this statement true itself? If this statement is true, how would you confirm this statement with science? And if you can't confirm this statement with science, then it must not be true, right? And if you're saying that this, tr this uh, statement is true without confirming it with science, then you refute your statement that all truth must be empirically confirmed with science. So it is a self-refuting statement. Um, here's a very obvious one. There is no absolute truth. Uh, very common statement by unbelievers, but um, it's a true. It's a statement saying that this is an absolute truth. That there is no absolute truth. Self-refuting. We cannot be certain about anything. And they're obviously usually very certain about that. Self-refuting again. I live in a world of I don't know. Um, they know that they live in a world of I don't know. So that's not a world of I don't know. Self-refuting again. Um, here's a very common one you'll even get uh, among professing Christians. Is uh, you should not judge. Okay, then why are you judging me? Uh, Self-refuting statement. Um, you're not being tolerant. Um, I believe in tolerance. Okay, then why aren't you tolerating me? Um, so the, uh, the intolerance of those who preach tolerance. Yes, yes. The intolerance of those who preach tolerance. You are closed-minded. I'm open-minded. Okay, so... Why are you so close-minded to my position of close-mindedness? Uh, it's a self-refuting position. Um, we're all close-minded. That's the point. We all have our worldviews, and we're closed off to other worldviews. All truth is relative. Okay, well, is that truth claim relative? Uh, what is true for you is not true for me. This is very, very common. Okay, well, is this statement here true for me? Self-refuting in nature. Okay, so challenging the inconsistency. Are, um, this is a question, are contradictions acceptable in your worldview? Are circular arguments acceptable in your worldview? How do you know your reasoning is valid? These are all questions we can ask the unbeliever. Could you be wrong about everything that you claim to know? Where do universals like the laws of logic come from? So let's challenge the inconsistency. The Bible is false uh, because it's full of contradictions. Okay, well, the, that's, a, that's a claim that they'll make to us. The Bible is false because it's full of contradictions. Actually, I got that yesterday uh, from a guy, I, a homeless guy I actually bought lunch for. Um, he just said the Bible was false. Uh, and so um, uh, the way that we could challenge that is, are contradictions always false in your worldview? How would you justify the existence of a universal law like the law of non-contradiction? How do you know your reasoning is valid? Uh, you believe the Bible is the word of God because the Bible says it's the word of God. Isn't that circular? Okay. Well, you're correct. That is circular. 
Uh, that is not why I believe the Bible is the Word of God. The Bible is true because if you don't start with the God of the Bible, you can't know anything at all. Proverbs 1, verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Are circular arguments acceptable in your worldview? Is it always wrong to use them? Where do you get a universal, unchanging law of logic? Could you be wrong about everything you claim to know? This is how we challenge the unbeliever in his inconsistent challenges against the Christian worldview in which his challenges presuppose the truth of the Bible. And um, the other thing we look at is uniformity of nature. Um, is the principle that the laws of nature will be the same in the future as they have always as they have been in the past um, It's also known as the inductive principle um, David Hume a naturalistic philosopher in the 18th century uh, proposed this problem of induction He challenged philosophers to come up with a justification for the uniformity of nature and stated that if the justification for the uniformity principle Was that it had just always been that way in the past the answer would be begging the question and Hume is exactly right and There is no solution to Hume's problem uh, the problem of induction except the Bible the Bible is the only solution to this problem, but yet the unbelieving world rejects the Bible. Um, there has been no naturalistic answer to humans' challenge, nor can there be. The only answer to the question is the God of the Bible. Let's look to see how the how Scripture justifies uniformity in nature. In Genesis 8.22, it says, While the earth remains seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, shall not cease. So it shall not cease because God has decreed that it shall not cease. He upholds the laws of nature. He continues to allow them to move forward. And Jeremiah 33, verse 20 through 21, um, uh, uh, the Lord here is speaking about how he upholds his covenants, uh, especially with David. And it says, Thus says the Lord, If you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night, so that the day and the night shall not come at their appointed time, then also my covenant with David my servant may be broken, so that he shall not have a son to reign on his throne, and my covenant with the Levitical and my covenant with the Levitical priests, my ministers. So God is saying here that his covenant with David and with the Levitical priesthood is as solid as his covenant is with the day and the night that they always occur in their um, appointed time and later on in that chapter it says in Jeremiah 33 verses 25 through 26 it says thus says the Lord if I have not established my covenant with the day and the night and here's a very interesting phrase and the fixed order of heaven and earth and the fixed laws and order of heaven and earth then I'll reject the offspring of Jacob and David, my servant, and I will not choose one of his offspring to rule over the offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for I will restore their fortunes, and I will have mercy on them. So God is saying that his covenant with David, that one of his offspring would rule over um, the offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is just as sure as his covenant with the day and the night and the fixed order of heaven and earth. In Numbers 23, verse 19, um, it says, God is not a man that he should lie, or the son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? So, Scripture justifies our belief that nature will be uniform. And that it will continue and that God will uphold it but a naturalistic worldview cannot provide any justification for this if the universe is an ever-changing mass of energy and matter in motion then why would there be absolute unchanging fixed law that says nature will always continue functioning as it does why doesn't gravity suddenly just stop working what is upholding it and what is continuing it that it will and the only justification the unbeliever can come up with is to beg the question well it's just always been that way in the past um, explain to me scientifically how God got all those animals on the ark there's another example where they'll challenge the unbeliever will challenge us and we need to challenge their inconsistency with their claim uh, you're asking me how to explain scientifically how God did something but you can't even justify your ability to do science itself without God 
How can we even do science without assuming uniformity? And how do you justify uniformity? Creationism is here. Here's another uh, one that they'll they'll say creationism is stupid because we know the universe is much older than six thousand years due to the scientifically proven speed of light. Um, we could respond to that. I would say that denying biblical creation is foolish because you can't do science without assuming uniformity, which is only justified by the God of the Bible. How can we do science without assuming uniformity, and how do you justify uniformity? Uh, flip it back on him. It's uh, scientifically impossible for a dead man to come back to life. The Bible claims that dead man, ca like Jesus, came back to life. Therefore, the Bible is false. Okay. Um, Let's look at this. Let's examine this. Acts 26, verse 8. Why, uh, Paul is saying to Agrippa here, why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? Um, you can't even do science without assuming the God of the Bible upholds and sustains the laws of nature, so why would it be incredible if the same God raised Jesus from the dead? Raising a dead man to life is elementary compared to creating the universe. How do you justify the laws of nature without God? challenge their inconsistency don't fold under these fallacious attacks against our faith um, the next thing here is uh, objective moral law um, is um, here here's the thing morality is either objective or it is subjective to say that um, it is something other than which the unbeliever tries to do he, he tries to see, to see either either mor morality is objective or it is not objective. And to say it is anything else is to violate the third law of logic, the law of excluded middle. There is no, there is nothing between objective and not objective. There is no third option. You know, my shirt is either black or it's not black. There is no other option. There is an excluded middle. There is no other option. So the atheist tries to always squeeze another option in there, but in doing so, he's committing a logical fallacy. So objective, to define our terms here, objective means that morality comes from some source outside of humanity, a, an objective universal source. Uh, subjective means that morality is determined by individuals, by humans. Um, objective morality can only be grounded in the God of the Bible. And objective moral laws require an objective lawgiver. Whenever the unbeliever says anything is good or bad, right or wrong, he is borrowing from the Christian worldview. Morality, according to the unbeliever's worldview, is just a personal preference. That's all he has. Uh, and he should not uh, impose his personal preference on anyone else. Uh, and he'll even tell you that uh, while he's imposing his personal preferences on you. It's like um, it's an example of a personal preference would be like I, I prefer peanut butter ice cream over chocolate ice cream. Well, and you know you prefer chocolate ice cream. That's what they reduce moral claims to, but they cannot remain consistent to it. And whenever they violate their claim that it's just a personal preference, because they say it's subjective, which is a personal preference, whenever they go outside of that, challenge their inconsistency. See, the same atheist that says that morality is subjective looked at the television screens when um, I think his name was Adam Lanza went through the Sandy Hook Elementary School and and uh, shot all those kids and went oh wow that's wicked and that's evil well how does he justify that in his worldview uh, you know Adam Lanza had his own subjective morality you know for him that was that was good you know why does he object to that he has no objection um, so if the unbeliever um, says he does not believe in objective moral values, this is how you can uh, challenge that. Ask him, um, or if, if he does, uh, sorry, I, I read my question wrong here. If the unbeliever says he does believe in objective moral values, simply ask him where they come from. Because if they're objective, they're, they're coming from something outside of himself. If he's a naturalist, then how does he justify um, where an objective moral value comes from. If it's objective and absolute and true, then where does he get this from a naturalistic worldview? If the unbeliever says he doesn't believe in morality at all, yeah, just steal his car. Um, I don't recommend to do that because there is objective moral values that says, you know, you got the Eighth Commandment, don't steal. So 
I would recommend that you not do that, but you could point out the inconsistency by demonstrating this to him. Um, if the unbeliever says that morality is subjective, once again, steal his car. You can't say your subject. You can't say your subjective morality says it's good. You can say your subjective morality says it's good to steal cars. It's good for you. It's beneficial to you. So um, that's why I'm going to steal your car because it's subjective. Ask him if morality is. If morality is subjective and is not objective or absolute, can he think of a situation where child rape and murder would be good? Um, <clears throat> I've, I've, I've asked that question. Um, I, I've even told him that um, I'm recording the conversation so that um, if they say that it's uh, it's not always wrong, I, I, I can have some evidence there. So that'll, that'll usually uh, wake him up a little bit. If the unbeliever says that morality is determined by society, Ask him why uh, was Hitler's society correct in their genocide of the Jews since the German society approved of the behavior? Um, ask him were social reformers like you know Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King Jr. morally wrong since they opposed the societal norms? Uh, you could ask them if you believe that morality is determined by society, and your neighbor says that morality is determined by what's best for himself. Who is right, you or him? Because he's going to have to appeal to an objective moral truth that says society determines morality, which is what he's denying. He's, he's denying um, objectivity. So um, it'll just demonstrate their inconsistency. Uh, the problem of evil, um, uh, also known as to theologians and stuff, theodicy. If God is good, then why is there evil? Um, the biblical answer for this is the Bible gives the reason for evil because God is good. He created humans in his image with the ability to choose. Uh, man chose to follow himself rather than God who is good. This is called sin. Evil exists because man's sin. Evil is allowed to exist temporarily because God is merciful. Um, the, and actually, uh, <laughs> I've, I actually should have changed this before I did the uh, presentation. Um, I I would hold that that is somewhat, uh, that is true. I would, however, um, qualify that, that God has good reasons for the evil in which he permits or even decrees to come, uh, come to pass. Um, so God has very good reasons. Uh, if you read Romans 9, um, he he allows evil uh, to demonstrate his justice and to then also um, to then demonstrate his mercy uh, to those that um, he is saving. So um, God has a perfectly uh, good reason for the evil that he permits and allows to happen. And his reason is always for good to accomplish both his justice and to demonstrate his mercy. And uh, a perfect example of this is, is of the cross itself. The cross itself, as it says in um, Acts 2 and 4, was uh, predestined, determined by God to happen, but that was a murder. And it was, in fact, the most uh, heinous sin ever done by man was to, was to murder the perfect, sinless Son of God. Um, yet God determined that to happen for his eternal good purposes to save his people from their sins, which was a good thing. So man's intention in that act was, or God's intention in that act was good, yet man's intention was evil. So I'm going to have to kind of modify my, um, add some stuff here to my presentation on this. But uh, uh, the problem of evil is actually the unbeliever's problem, not the Christian's. If we are just stardust, then there would be no such thing as evil or good. When one star collides into another and annihilates it, we don't call that action morally evil. So if we're, you know, just cosmic bags of stardust, if that's all we are, then they, they don't have any position to say that anything is evil or good. There's no grounding for it. Um, one question you could ask an unbeliever is, should God judge evil immediately when it happens? And if that's so, then um, uh, should he judge you the moment that you lie? Um, 
bring it back to their moral obligation to God and how they've broken God's law. Um, another example that we can we can to try to get the unbeliever to think is um, we can give the example, and I think this is an example done by Douglas Wilson. Um, I think he did this uh, in a debate with, um, uh, I forget who he was debating, um, but he, he gave this example, and I think it's a really good one. It says, how do, since the unbeliever believes that we're just the, the result of natural processes and we're just chemicals reacting together, is um, the question that can be asked is, how do chemical reactions produce truth or morality? So if I shake a can of Pepsi and I shake a can of Dr. Pepper, does the Pepsi produce good and right fizz and the Dr. Pepper produce bad and wrong fizz? No, we would say that they're amoral. It's neutral. There's uh, chemical reactions don't produce good, right, bad, and wrong. Um, these are properties of moral creatures who willfully know and have knowledge of God's law and his truth, but yet willfully um, go against that revelation. Uh, the proof that God exists, the proof that God exists is that without him, you could not prove anything at all. Without God, we could not know anything at all. Um, the proof of God that God exists is the impossibility of the contrary. There is no other option other than God existing. So what we need to get to um, at this point is uh, in our apologetic situation is we really need to get to the gospel. We cannot do uh, and have an apologetic situation without, without going to the gospel. And um, the way of the master has, has uh, um, some good techniques, and I, th I think uh, uh, mostly biblical, <laughs> in uh, their approach to evangelism. And um, and so I would uh, I would recommend using uh, their method um, to use God's law, His moral law, as outlined in the Old Testament, um, in the Ten Commandments, to bring people to the knowledge of their sin before God, and that God will judge them based upon His moral law. And um, ninety nine percent of the time, when an unbeliever is asked if they are a good person, they will declare their own goodness. After all, they're not as bad as that other guy. Um, and that's what I've noticed in my uh, in my street witnessing and witnessing to family and friends. With this question, don't challenge their inconsistency in saying they're a good person. Let them borrow from the Christian worldview because we are going to go into a line of questioning that appeals to the conscience that God has given them. Um, in Romans 2.14 it says, For when the Gentiles who do not have the law by nature, uh, or do not have the law, uh, speaking of the Torah, uh, the first five books of the Bible uh, is typically what the New Testament writers referred to when they were speaking of the law. Um, the Old Testament was divided into the law, the prophets, and the and the Psalms. Uh, by nature, do what the law requires. They are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They, God did not give them the Torah. Uh, they show that the works of the law is written on on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them so the unbeliever has God's law written upon his heart so by going to God's revelation where he reveals uh, his moral law we can appeal to their conscience in Romans 3 20 it says uh, for since through the law comes knowledge of sin so um, it's already written upon our heart we we tend to suppress that, or we do suppress that, um, and we justify ourselves, but the law exposes that and brings us to the knowledge of sin. So you can go through the Ten Commandments. Uh, you can ask them if they've, if they've kept the, uh, the commandments of God. Uh, I'm just going to put them up on the screen here. Um, like the Ninth Commandment, how many lies have you told in your life? The Eighth Commandment, have you ever taken anything that was not yours, irrespective of its value, which is thou shalt not steal? The Seventh Commandment, have you ever looked with lust? You can appeal to Matthew 5.28, where Jesus says that whosoever looks upon a woman to lust after her commits adultery in his heart. Um, so we can then bring them to the bad news. If God judged you by his moral law, would he find you innocent or guilty? And if he does find you guilty, will he need to send you to heaven or hell? Um, in Revelations 21, verse 8, it says, "For But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for the murderers, the sexually immoral, um, the sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. 
Um, if you've ever lied, if they've admitted that they're a liar, the Bible says that all liars will have their portion in the lake of fire. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9 says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Um, you can quote these verses to them to show that there is indeed bad news. That is what brings the good news. The good news is that 2,000 years ago, the judge himself, Jesus Christ, entered creation to die a penal substitutionary death for those who repent and trust in Jesus Christ. And um, penal substitutionary means that he took our place. He took upon himself the punishment that was due us. Um, <clears throat> and we must repent. We must turn away from our sins. We must put our faith and trust in into Christ's finished work on the cross for our own salvation and not our own goodness. Um, so there's some additional resources um, I would recommend. Um, let me switch the screen here. Um, obviously, be reading your Bible. If the, the Bible is the foundation of all knowledge and truth, uh, become well versed into it. Dig into it daily. Grow in the Lord with it. Um, there is a, also another book uh, which I would recommend. Uh, called the fallacy detective and uh, it's going to help you become more sharpened when it comes to recognizing logical fallacies out there um, one of the great books I think out there today on um, understanding presuppositionalism at a more basic level is dr. Jason Lyle's book the ultimate proof of creation um, is one of the first books that I read on it um, you know I'd also recommend books like uh, dr. Greg Bonson's uh, presuppositionalism stated and defended I believe is the title of it uh, Van Til and uh, John Frame um, also have some great uh, well Van Til <laughs> presuppositionalism Van Til is really the founder of presuppositionalism but um, uh, as it's known uh, in uh, modern times at least uh, I think presuppositionalism has been used throughout all history to one degree or the other <coughs> but um, it's been more formalized uh, here in the in the 21st uh, or the 20th century um, so another great resource is a video uh, done by Cy Tin Bergenkate. He really brings presuppositionalism down to the street level, to the interaction that we have with unbelievers. Um, and uh, this is how to answer the fool. And I believe uh, you can get that possibly from proof that God exists.com or, or you can just Google how to answer the fool and uh, you can pick that video up. It's a great resource. Um, also, uh, I'd encourage you to take... Um, uh, the course from the way of the master on evangelism as, as a start um, into um, into biblical evangelism so okay well I want to thank you guys for uh, for joining me on uh, the first full episode of the logical belief ministries podcast um, <coughs> we're going to uh, uh, continue in the next few episodes to go through the Bonson and Stein debate and to cover that in um, uh, in more detail and break that down and um, so I encourage you guys to join us uh, I would encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel um, and to uh, subscribe to us on iTunes and um, uh, also uh, you can visit our website logicalbelief.org and you can look for uh, if there's new articles I've posted out there um, I cover everything from Jehovah's Witnesses to Mormonism. Uh, we'll be talking about those different topics uh, also on this uh, on this show as as those uh, different uh, opportunities come up. So I uh, want to thank you guys for joining us and uh, God bless and uh, have a great uh, rest of your week. That the unjust will not inherit God's kingdom, and through Adam's offense, condemnation came to man, and so.